my talk is going to be about generic programming techniques because I think it's an important topic for, for library design in general and also for code reusability, which is an issue in, in many Fortran projects. And I will show you um, a specific example for generic programming, which is the, um, a, a small code that I wrote for, for general tensor contraction. So, um, oh, sorry. That, okay. I didn't want that. Okay. So, I'm a PhD student in theoretical chemistry at the University of Zurich, and I'm working on the CV2K project, which is a quantum chemistry and solid state physics code implemented in Fortran 2008. And CP2K is particularly strong in algorithms that are based on sparse linear algebra. And these implementations are based on, on a library called DBCSR, which is a sparse matrix vector, uh, matrix tensor library. And just to mention a few of the tools that we use in CP2K to facilitate development in Fortran. So this is the FIP preprocessor that we already heard of two times already in this conference and which is used um, for template and macros which are based on Python expressions. Then we use an auto formatter for our code that was developed by me uh, at Prettify that um, does auto formatting of, of white space and indentation and um, we use Ford to generate documentations. So I just mentioned this because I think we can highly recommend those tools because it actually facilitates development a lot. And my work um, is, or, or my scientific interest is algorithms based on sparse tensor contractions. And for that purpose, I extended the DBCSR sparse matrix library to uh, uh, general tensor contractions. And so, first of all, what does sparse mean? As you already heard in the talk from Maximilian Ambroise, who, who also talked about DBCSR, um, sparse means that most matrix elements are zero and should not be stored or computed. Um, so, and because of that work, so that I tried to extend this very specific matrix library to general tensor contractions. So this is actually the inspiration to talk here about generic programming because uh, I use generic programming techniques a lot to come up with a very general API. Um, but in this talk, I'm not going to talk more about the DBCSR library, but I'm going to show you a, a slightly simpler example. So a code that I developed in a few days that actually just highlights some of the, um, some of the generic programming techniques. So what is generic programming in general? Um, so essentially what it means or what is the more technical definition is that uh, you apply the same algorithm to different data types. So a typical example that you implement the sort algorithm for uh, arbitrary data types. But a more broad definition I also think is important is that you solve a class of related problems instead of tackling each specific problem on its own. So it's not only about the data, but it's also about the algorithm that you choose. So that you choose a general algorithm that can be applied to many different problems. Now, what are important generic programming ingredients? So first is that there is runtime polymorphism, which means that you have a generic type that represents multiple specific types so a common example is that you have a shape class that can be um, then that, that, that is um, specified by a rectangle or a triangle uh, type. And the second ingredient is, is templates and macros, which is also called usually a compile time polymorphism. And this means that you generate code for for different types so that you generate different specific implementations for different data types. Now polymorphism is I would say fully supported already in Fortran 2003 but not so for templates and macros. So Fortran standard does not include any notion of templates or macros and 
compilers typically implement a very basic preprocessor, which is uh, CPP, the traditional mode, or FPP, which is really restricted to very basic functionalities, usually to just include and define. And typically for generic programming, Thank you. So, um, usually the, the preprocessor, the Fortran preprocessor, is used to include common code snippets. So, instead of copy paste a snippet of code, you just put it in a different file and then you include it using the preprocessor. So, this is just a variant of copy paste. So, what are typical workarounds in Fortran? So, either you do code duplication, so you write the same code again and again, which is, of course, problematic because then you start fixing bugs, for instance, in double precision, but the single precision implementation still has the same bug, and it's also problematic for refactoring. You have code generators. Here you delegate the generic programming to another language, and you have uh, preprocessors, external preprocessors, which means that you extend the Fortran syntax with an external macro language. And actually, I opt for the third because I think it's the most easy to use and also, um, also safe to use. And yeah. So the example I want to demonstrate today is um, general tensor contractions. So here on the top, you find two expressions of tensor contractions. And here below, you find uh, example implementation of how you would implement this in Fortran generically. So how it works, you start with some um, arrays, either of real type or here on the right side of integer type. Then you just allocate and assign the data and then you can create a tensor object directly from the data. And then you call uh, subroutine, uh, a function called tensor einsam, uh, which is the tensor summation convention to then do the contraction and output the result tensor C. So what you can see here, the summation is implicit. So the summation is over the indices that are repeated. So it's over the, the, sec, over the index two and the index three is the summation. And this notation is very generous. With this, you can implement any tensor contraction you want. And it's actually also the, um, the API of commonly used Python libraries such as NumPy or, or PyTorch. And here, actually, my implementation is in 500 lines of Fortran. And I will show snippets in this talk. And you can also find it here uh, on GitHub. So if you start with tensor contraction, uh, then probably you start with doing writing Fortran code like this. But I think this is not a good starting point for a generic implementation because the generic code um, also needs to be optimized. So you need to care about loop unrolling, blocking, and parallelization. So do it in a direct way is not really recommendable. Now, what is the strategy for a generic implementation? So the first thing that you realize is that all tensor contractions can be mapped to products of matrices and vectors. And because those operations are already implemented in existing and, and optimized libraries, such as the Fortran intrinsics or BLAST library, um, you can reuse those, those, this functionality. And um, here you see a couple of examples of tensor contractions. And also men I mentioned here how they map to matrix of products with matrices and vectors. Then the tensor type should incorporate all kinds of different data types. So at least we want integer real complex in four byte or eight byte precision. And we have different tensor ranks here, just shows zero to seven. Zero is a scalar, one is a vector, two is a matrix and so on. So we end up with 48 different base data types. And since we don't want to implement them all by ourselves, we need a code generator or a preprocessor to do that for us. Now, the implementation uh, is based on the following hierarchy. So it's actually quite general. I would say every generic programming would, would actually uh, could be described by this hierarchy. On the API level, you have a generic implementation, which is a generic algorithm working on generic types or abstract classes in Fortran. So you don't really care about the data. You just implement to so just use the algorithm and then on the actual specific implementation uh, this is here the third point in yellow so you do implementations of all specific types and 
because this is very uh, re repeated code, you, you generate this by some other tool. And the in-between layer, which I call dynamic, is then to map the generic algorithms to very specific implementations, which is done by the select type construct in Fortran. Then this is actually how I decide my code. So most parts is in blue, which means that it's actually generic. And then here on the bottom, where you actually do touch the data and do the calculations with the data, um, you call specific Fortran functions. And in between in green is actually the dynamic functions that select from the general algorithm, select the specific implementations for a specific data type. And how um, this looks like in Fortran, so here you just have classes, so purely generic. And here in the dynamic function, you use the, the select type construct to actually select based on the type to specific implementations. So I think I'm running out of time. So here is just to show you how it's done in practice. Here I have my abstract type. And then I have several, so this is just the data. And then I have several instances, um, which are just arrays of different uh, ranks and different data types. As said before, you have many of those. So, you, uh, so it's better to uh, generate them using a preprocessor. And this is how it's done with the FIP preprocessor. So I would say it's much more compact, but it's also ugly, so it's hard to read, but it's very compact and it's, hard, it's much easier to maintain. So here is just a slide on the functionality of, of the FIP preprocessor. Uh, fortunately, I don't have time to, to go into that more. You have iterated output to simulate templates. Then you have macros. And you can also insert arbitrary Python expressions. Now, these are the macros I defined in FIP for my tensor code. Um, so for instance, I have this shape macro that takes a rank N and then converts it to the Fortran array notation. And this will then generate this array notation here. So here, then I go on to my tensor type. Tensor is essentially contains some data. This is already my abstract data class. And it also has a shape. And then the constructor, what it does, it essentially takes a data array. So this is this, heavily templated by FIP. This is just a plain array and converts it into a, a general tensor type. So as promised, the final implementation of the tensor einsam, which is the tensor contraction, is purely generic. So from a tensor, I convert to a matrix. And then I do the matrix product, which actually could be a vector matrix product, or a vector vector dot product, or a matrix matrix product. And then I convert back to the matrix, and I convert the matrix back to the tensor. And this is then the, the result I get from the function. Then the matrix product, I actually have to walk through all different combinations of different types and also do a loop with the FIP preprocessor to automate the, the many combinations that I have. And then based on the tensor, on the matrix rank, so whether it's a scalar vector or a matrix, I select a specific implementation. So either dot product or ma matrix multiplication. This just quickly, um, the Fortran standard already provides, provides matrix multiplication and dot product, but the outer product we implement ourselves. Here we do function overloading by creating an interface and doing a FIP loop to have all instances in this interface. And then we implement it very basic, very basic way like here and do templates using FIP. So now I arrive to the conclusions. I hope that I could convince you that Generic programming is very helpful to implement complex problems in, le in less lines of code. I want to point out that modern Fortran APIs can be as elegant or simple as commonly used Python packages. I mentioned two important ingredients to enable generic programming in Fortran, which is a preprocessor and object-oriented programming. I introduced the FIP preprocessor. And just last but not least, I want to also mention some limitations so if you use an external 
preprocessor, um, all the templates and combinations of templates have to be explicitly in, in instantiated and compiled, which leads to large binary size and possibly long compile, compilation times. And the full example code you can find here uh, on the link that's on, on GitHub. So now I'm ready to take some questions, but probably we don't have too much time. I will also uh, answer all questions on, on, on Slack. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this brilliant talk. Um, we have actually time to discuss some questions. Um, there's a very practical one. Do you know of any intendation syntax highlighting tools for the FYPP? So for the, for the FIP, for the, yes. for the language of FIP, so I don't know any, but since it's essentially Python, there should be ways to get at least the Python part of, of FIP expressions highlighted. But for that, probably you have to, to create your own tool. And so I don't know of any that does that, right? Because basically most of the time syntax highlighting is based on the file extension. And it's probably hard to highlight Python expressions within macros. So this is my answer. Thanks. Um, let's just wait a little. I see that there are some people typing. Yeah. Um, regarding generated code, how do you generate interfaces for functions where only the return value differs? So that's a tough question. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's not possible. Maybe somebody else has more knowledge about that and can comment on Slack. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let's wait uh, a few more seconds. How well does the tensor library scale with the number of nodes? I, it's more about the tensor library. But... So this is about DPCSR? um yeah i guess it's more about so typically we use it on so i use it up to thousand nodes so each node has 12 cores so it's it scales well i would say good um so this is about the dpcs are not this example because this example is not parallelized of course it's just a very stripped down version of 